to start. Okay, so uh, I'll try to talk about the future directions, what we can do during this collaboration, focusing on this particular subject of uh, uh, long confining strings, and I'll explain why this is the object we plan to focus on. Uh, so, of course, understanding the world sheet theory of uh, confining strings or flux tubes, I will use this interchangeably uh, in this talk, uh, is a very important step on understanding confinement itself uh, from this uh, uh, very famous plots of uh, rigid trajectories in the uh, hadronic spectrum. We uh, know that string is the uh, real object um, in QCD, uh, but of course, in this, uh, it, it, it's worth first understanding um, some simplified uh, models. And in particular, in this talk, we will focus on uh, pure young mills in the uh, planar limit, uh, and I will talk about three and four dimensions. Uh, I hope it will be clear when, when I refer to the three D mills, when to four D mills, and when I refer to both of them simultaneously. And then, okay, uh, if if we succeed in understanding this, we can uh, try to generalize to more realistic models by uh, listing uh, those assumptions. Uh, so, what is a what is a long string? Uh, Roughly, my definition of a long string is uh, when uh, there is a limit uh, such that the uh, low energy world sheet effective field theory uh, works. Uh, so there are these uh, three, three, three types that I identify. One is the long string that, that lives in flat space and goes along the uh, entire universe and that is approximately straight. Uh, and uh, in this case, effective field theory works if we consider some uh, excitations of this string with uh, energies that are smaller than uh, lambda QCD. Uh, then we can uh, put this uh, compactify one of the directions and consider a string that is uh, winding um, around the world. Uh, or we can uh, take a rotating string, which at uh, large angular momentum uh, also becomes long, and effective field theory can be applied to it. So the simplest object is this number one, and this is what uh, I'm going to discuss mostly in this talk. Uh, but uh, these two are also very useful. Well, th this is what can be uh, efficiently measured on the lattice, and we're going to use the lattice results. Uh, and uh, this object is uh, you know, something closer to the uh, real world observables, like uh, high spin global spectrum. So it's a next step would be to go from, from here to here. Good, uh, here is the brief uh, outline of my talk. So um, I will start with uh, a brief recap uh, of the existing results, namely effective field theory and lattice simulations. Uh, and uh, I mean, I realized that yesterday, uh, Sergey in particular gave a very nice uh, presentation of this subject and Andreas gave a presentation of this subject. So I will be short, I'll try not to bore people who were here yesterday, but then of course I realized that you know, not everyone remembers. Um, and what this what this talks were about. So I'll try I'll try to to review it a little bit, uh, and then I will move to uh, to future directions, which is roughly will be the idea of uh, which analytic methods can we use to understand this uh, long strings beyond the uh, effective field theory. Uh, and uh, okay, I, I want to talk about uh, two ideas. So so this is by future directions. I mean something that's I wouldn't even call it work in progress. It is really the the ideas. So. Uh, inevitably, I will say something wrong or, or something that probably doesn't make sense. Uh, so if you can kill one of these future directions <laughs> during this talk, then you'll save us some time. But I want to emphasize that, that there is a sort of separation between this part. The, the fact that I say something wrong in this part does not mean that this part is wrong, okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll try to separate carefully between things that, that I understand and that I don't understand. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the, the ideas that I have in mind is uh, we're going to talk some integrable approximations to this uh, more realistic world sheet theories. Uh, then I will talk about what happens when we uh, put uh, young mills in anti decider space. Uh, and then um, uh, in green, I have the world sheet S matrix booster. Probably I will not have time. By the way, I think there is a mistake in the schedule and I have 35 minutes instead of 25. But anyway, I'll try at least not to go over time. Uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about this as well. Good, uh, let's start with this uh, review. Uh, so here we have this uh, long string, and uh, the universal prediction is that there are gallstones. Uh, these are two-dimensional fields. Uh, there are d minus two of them. I label them by xi, and they correspond to uh, translations 
long wavelengths uh, displacements of the string. I will also consider the subject X mu, which is basically grouping Xi together with the world sheet coordinates. So this object is dimensional. And this is sort of referred to as a static gauge approach. Uh, then there are this, uh, the idea is that the action can be constructed out of geometric quantities, induced metric, extrinsic curvature that is going to play some role, uh, and also the uh, intrinsic curvature. Uh, and then the important step that, okay, there is a three level action, the leading in derivative expansion, which is number water, and then at one loop order, there is nothing you can write because the curvature is a total derivative, and that gives some additional universality to this. Uh, um, Sigma model, let's say, compared to you know pi and sigma model, where you always have a, uh, some counter term at one loop. Uh, but then, of course, at higher loops, uh, you get some uh, some non-universal coefficients. Okay, and then if we Taylor expand this action uh, in LS, well, we get some non-renormalizable theory that we can that we can study uh, effectively. Uh, so now, uh, on the long string, we can consider this uh, world sheet as matrix. And first, we assume that there are no extra massless degrees of freedom other than gold stones. And this is actually confirmed by the lattice measurements. Okay. Uh, so, uh, three level uh, is this universal and more or less integrable. Integral means that this S matrix has no particle production, it's uniquely classified by the, specified by the 2 to 2 S matrix. Now, because of that one loop counter term was absent, one loop is also universal. And in fact, there is a universal particle production. You can calculate this S2 to 4. And schematically, there is some dependence on momentum and flavors that I drop. But importantly, it is proportional to D minus 26 and D minus 3. So this way, we see, in fact, the field theory why 26 is special. Uh, however, say, you know, 4, this, this quantity does not vanish for, in 4D. So it is a pure you know, theoretical prediction combined with this. Uh, lattice uh, uh, exclusion of extra massive pi massless particles that uh, d dimension sorry, four dimensional QCD string uh, cannot be integrable. Well, a 3D string could be integrable at least on the symmetry properties, but again, it is not. And th this allows some detailed lattice result that I think Sergey mentioned yesterday that we see some level splitting that exclude integrability uh, in, uh, in three dimensions as well. Uh, so now, uh, lattice data identified no additional massive world sheet excitation. Okay, I first talked about massless world sheet excitation. There are none in, in, in three or four dimensions. Now we talk, go to more detailed uh, uh, lattice results. We look for massive excitation from the world sheet of the three. In 3D, there are none so far. In 4D, there is a single excitation, which was uh, this sort of interesting surprise. It is a pseudo-scalar, as opposed to maybe some scalar breezy mode that... Uh, that um, uh, that, that maybe some people had intuition uh, for appearing. Uh, okay, and this is again, very, so this is for world sheet axiom. Yesterday was mentioned uh, several times. And uh, okay, I, I, I still uh, wanted to remember it because we think that this is some uh, important hint, okay, on what the structure, the world sheet of QCD string would be. So this is something, you know, we did not know say 20 years ago about the, the world sheet, uh, whatever the QCD theory, that's something that we learn relatively recently, okay, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and and uh, we think that it is an important hint and I will try to elaborate uh, on this hint. So then it means that we just an effective field theory, uh, we add the action for this massive particle. So there is the full action is effective field theory action plus uh, what I write here, okay, this, uh, I think Sergey called the axiom phi, I call it A. Uh, there's a kinetic term, there's a mass term and then there is a coupling. Okay, so here I geometrize this coupling but important part of that coupling is a cubic vertex that uh, allows axion to decay in two goals. So this K is roughly uh, D alpha D beta Xi, okay, plus some correction. So this vertex is really A D squared X D squared X, okay? Uh, and then from uh, also from fitting the lattice data, we can measure both the mass of the axion that is, you know, order one in QCD units. So this uh, LS is, of course, for the lambda QCD, there's the string tension. Uh, but still, uh, it turns out that the fact that field theory is under control in this regime, so we can trust predictions over here. And then we can also measure the coupling, and then the coupling turns out proportional to this number. Okay, I'm dropping some pi's, but it's proportional to square root of uh, four minus 25. So why write four minus 25? Because of course, uh, you know that, that that would be the coupling of say, uh, critical linear dilaton theory. Okay, so there's something special about this number. It turns out numerically within the uh, lattice um, and our theoretical uncertainty is roughly 10%. Number turns out to be the case. Uh, and that means uh, what? That if we go to sort of high energies, energies above this uh, mass of the axion, which we sort of 
barely can trust our effective field theory, but we kind of can. Uh, then uh, with this value of the copying, this diagram that I, I hope everyone can see it, the three-level diagram of the axiom cancels this universal one loop particle production. Okay, so you sort of restore integrability uh, at least approximately when you go above the energies of this particle. It could be numerical coincidence, could be some interesting uh, hint, right? Now, uh, as I said, it is important to, to realize, and I'm sort of summing up my conclusion, uh, that the 2D theory of infinitely long string uh, exists and it is a UV complete, okay, of infinitely long string in, in N to infinity limit. Now, it's a separate question how to go from this long string to some more realistic observables like gluons. And I, I, I think uh, uh, Sharzat will talk about it uh, tomorrow about some ideas. But I want to emphasize these are two different things. Okay, this thing we know exists for sure. Can we you know, solve this theory uh, and, uh, and go to, to the short series factor? Okay, that's a separate question. We go, we go step by step. Um, and what I want to do, what I want, so we haven't solved this series, but we know that it's non-integrable, so we'll probably, you know, not solve it, not write an analytic answer for the sense matrix, but the question, how well can we do? Okay, and in this talk, I want to discuss some deformations uh, of the theory that, uh, uh, that are a bit simpler and that, uh, that maybe we can solve and then go back to the real thing. Uh, any questions about my introduction, about my review? Uh, so now I go to my this this first uh, future direction that I wanted to mention is the integrable approximation. Uh, so there are two theories uh, that we're going to consider. It is a three-dimensional uh, long string uh, with no additional degrees of freedom, and uh, so it's a single Goldstone boson with e to the s uh, s method. And this is also for, for people who are familiar, this is a TT bar deformation of a, a single massless bottom. Okay. Uh, and then another theory that we're going to consider is a four dimensional string with, of course, two gold stones that are there in four dimensions and a massless world sheet axiom. And again, with this S matrix. So here you see I added the flavor indices for the S matrix, means that it's diagonal. So these indices go now over the gold stones and also the axiom. And they again scatter with this uh, E to the S S matrix. So why we want to consider this series, I define them at the level of the S matrix. Of course, I can write down effective action for them, but, but there is really non-perturbative definition. Because these theories, they realize non-linearly Poincaré symmetry, both in three and four dimensions, OK? So I mentioned that that was possible in 3D. So, it, so in 4D, it's basically the theory is obtained in some sense by taking this you know, real uh, young mean flux tube and then taking the max of the axiom to 0, keeping the coupling fixed whatever, to this special value, square root of 11. Uh, and, and that procedure cancels now, uh, not at high energies, but at all energies cancels the particle protection. OK. Good. So now there is a concrete theoretical question. What is the UV complete description which makes this uh, symmetry manifest? Because okay, we have asymmetric description. We say we've, we've proven, uh, actually, with Sergey that the, the only integrable uh, S matrix uh, that can satisfy uh, the symmetry, but it's very obscure, you know, how is that non linear realized in terms of soft symmetries, so soft theorems. Uh, but we want to some uh, more simple description, okay? And it's the first guess, okay, it's look for some uh, Polyakov like description. And Polyakov like uh, here, I mean, uh, really uh, some sequel 26 uh, CFT, which will have the following properties in our case. First of all, it should realize uh, Poincare limitless. Okay. Second, this CFT should have something like a long string background uh, with only one degree of freedom in case of D equal three, and then uh, this uh, three uh, light uh, degrees of freedom uh, around it. So finally, okay, then I have third point that it should also have E to the S S matrix. So really, to 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 answer this question, we want to satisfy all these three. Uh, so now uh, the, I put the last one in parentheses for the following reason that if we, you know, satisfy the first two uh, and, and not three, it will sort of be also interesting because then we'll find some other uh, uh, candidate for the Rothschild theory, right? It will be sort of more surprising because uh, this guy, which is know that it exists, okay? Something else we do not know. Uh, but real string, of course, exists, but, uh, but, but it sounds like it's a harder problem. But this we don't have to. Uh, get good. Uh, now, what does not work? Okay, just to make it clear, uh, say D3 bosons 
uh, that was just a tensor product with some 26 uh, my C equal 26 minus D CFT, for example, linear deals. Okay, why that does not work? That, of course, will be a critical theory. But if we go on the long string background, these bonds they do not talk to the CFT, so there will be extra mass of degrees of freedom. Okay, just to make sure it's not as as trivial as this. Okay, now instead, what and here we use because of what I mentioned, we use the skin that axiom is uh, transforms non trivially. Sorry, it's D minus one here, of course, under under Poincare symmetry. Right, and this uh, suggests uh, that there is another geometric sector, geometric in the sense that it uh, uh, knows about the full target space uh, Poincare invariance, and this sector must be non-trivially coupled to 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 axes. So this uh, reminds uh, reminded us a little bit of the ideas that uh, uh, Paul Wigman uh, had uh, in the in the late eighties uh, when uh, somehow people applied uh, ideas like geometric quantization to um, uh, to string theory and uh, uh, basically try to get some uh, purely geometric picture for for the fermions for RNS fermions and for uh, Greenshaw fermions, but okay, it's, it's not. Completely clear how to apply these ideas. There are also older ideas by by Polyakov. I don't know if he's, maybe he's going to talk about them uh, today uh, later. Uh, by basically using extrinsic geometry of the string in some some way. So so, so suggests uh, that it works. And moreover, uh, we believe that it's uh, natural to consider uh, the uh, d equal three and d equal four theories together, basically by promoting axiom to an anti-symmetric form. And this anti-symmetric form it has one degree of freedom in four dimensions uh, and uh, zero degrees of freedom um, uh, in three dimensions. Okay, um, but sort of off shell, we, we believe that or it is conjecture that it should be something like a geometric object that off shell additional degrees of freedom should also exist in three dimensions. And uh, well, it's it's actually an open question whether this family of theories continues to other to other uh, dimensions. You can look up this paper. Uh, so, so what could it be? Okay. So again, something something we're trying. Uh, not sure that it's going to work, but something that's natural to try is to have some sigma model uh, with the correct symmetry. So here I just wrote just a vector that lives in uh, okay Euclidean. Uh, uh, let, let's focus on three D. So let's focus on three D. So it's some vector that lives uh, uh, on a three sphere or in Lorentz and will live on corresponding hyperbolic manifold. Uh, so we can write down some sigma model, and then now we want to couple uh, to. So if we didn't write the second line, okay, this sigma model maybe it will flow to some CFT. Okay, it will be sort of the first example that I had doesn't work because the sigma model will remain uh, either gap out, become trivial, or remain massless on the Rothschild, which is not good. But now because we have now two Poincaré isometries and we only need one diagonal one, we can actually couple these two sectors through some form of couplings like this. Okay, uh, and now uh, it is in this action, which is of course just classical action. It's not the the full thing. I mean, it's not uh, it's not conformal uh, at one loop, but classically this is kind of valid. And then if we give a uh, long string background, then this uh, n mu will will get out. Okay. Now uh, we what we try to do is just to look okay for weakly coupled string background with this kind of properties. That doesn't seem to work. Okay, uh, but okay, we, we can do something more fancy. We can promote uh, this sector to some strongly coupled CFT. If we keep the symmetries, it, uh, one candidate it's is some SL2R uh, level KWZW, which is well, sort of nice because it can have continuous K and in principle any central charge. So you can believe that you have a handle to tune the central charge. You then couple is to some operators. Of course, these operators are again uh, are not exactly marginal, it will flow somewhere. And okay, could it, the question here could it flow to the CFT with the right properties? Of course, you may say, well, that that that's very naive, uh, and there will be, there will be many problems. And one, uh, this is one is unitarity because the SL to us, of course, we have one ghost which is like zero, but now we added some other ghosts because of this non-compact CFT. Uh, however, they couple together, and okay, one can sort of cross fingers and hope that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, all the ghosts will be killed by the Verasora constraint. And in fact, uh, here for our current purpose, we require a weaker condition that's no ghost in the uh, long string sector. Only the game. Maybe some ghosts become infinitely heavy or you know, very heavy on the on the long string background. Uh, and also, uh, we should remember that we're not looking for the 
we're looking for inductive real approximation, okay? We're looking for some approximation. So maybe also um, the theory itself should not be described by the by this world sheet CFT. And, and okay, so we have sort of more freedom for this object that we study. We're not claiming that that is on its own a theory of the, of the real world. Uh, and I think at this point, it, it may be useful. Again, it was mentioned yesterday by, by Offer, but uh, it's useful to recap, you know, what do examples of confining backgrounds uh, known in, in string theory, uh, what do they teach us? So they, uh, all known backgrounds, they rely on the presence uh, of Ramonram of fluxes. And moreover, the classically, if you look at the action, uh, that's non integrable. Okay, there is a part of the action where basically x is coupled to the say radial direction, and you can just see from this vertex you'll necessarily get some particle production. Okay, so uh, it would be nice to understand, uh, you know, what what is the of, of course it's on its own a famous problem, uh, sort of you know what what is the uh, world sheet description of Ramon Ramon backgrounds, and okay maybe if, at least for a small Ramon Ramon flux. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, again, it's uh, wishful thinking, but maybe uh, turning on this Ramon Ramon flux, it's something like adding marks to the axiom. Okay, so it's a little bit of this spirit. We kind of lose the Rolsch safety description and we break it, the gravity sort of softly by this mass. So maybe if we understood, then, then we would know how to deform our theory that, okay, we haven't constructed yet, but on the way to constructing, let's say. So that would be the next step. Uh, and, and also, again, it's not a precise analogy, but I want to remind you that uh, I'm still uh, sort of circling back on this non-unitarity issue that, that I think will be pressing. Um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but there are examples where non-unitary CFTs, you know, describe physical phenomena. That's something we worked out with, with Bernard and with Slava Richkov. For example, when you have a weak first sort of phase transition, you don't really have a real fixed point, but there is some fixed point that sits like in the complex plane. But but that is still useful to describe the real world. See, that's not conformal. So just uh, again, um, uh, now yesterday people asked about uh, fermions on the world sheet, and I just wanted to quickly uh, say my view on this. Okay, suppose something of I, I, I suggest it worked, and say in any number of dimension, and then okay, this the CFTs of the WZW source they can be you know bosonized or fermionized. And it could be that fermionic description is, you know, more appropriate. And, and to me, that would be roughly, you know, the, the idea of having fermions in the world sheet. And again, the condition is that in, in dimensions uh, that are larger than three, uh, some, you know, masses, degrees of freedom are present on the long string background. And okay, and equal to uh, at least all local degrees of freedom should decouple in the world sheet on the long string background. By the way, you uh, you sure how much time I have? I have uh, 13 minutes by my calculation. Well, but that's with discussion. So I was showing you 10 before 35. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. 35 plus 5. Then you're tricking me, but okay, because I have my own time. Anyway, um, the, 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 the second topic, maybe I should pause. Sorry, maybe I should pause uh, here if, if there were questions uh, about, uh, about this first topic. So your first formulation had no world sheet from me. And even master one, you just yeah. have some SL, uh, SLR sigma model coupled to 3x news. Yes. But then I'm saying, OK, most of these WZWs also also admit fermionic discrete. OK, many of them. Are, maybe all of them. I it's don't a, know. It's a non thing. Well, in my answer, the signature should be something non-compact, right? Because I want this to have, it to have this symmetry. So I'll be surprised if it can be compact. Yeah, I don't play with further. Okay, I, I wrote somewhere that we were thinking about it with Sergey with further also with Guzman, but it's not configured. Okay, good. Uh, now, Young Nielsen ADS. Okay, we're discussing with, with a bunch of people for, for several years. Uh, was, I think, first suggested by, by Colin and Wilczek that it could be useful to put confining gauge theories. Uh, in ADS. So now uh, the question of boundary conditions uh, is uh, interesting uh, and, and, and rich. Uh, sorry, I forgot to put references. There is a paper by Offer and uh, Michael Berkos uh, and others about, about 4D. Uh, and, and there is a paper by Nabil Iqbal. Uh, oh my God, Tom. 
the whatever the entropy uh, Tom Falcon. Uh, I think about uh, about three uh, about three D uh, boundary conditions. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to focus on Newman boundary conditions, uh, for which uh, Jan Mills I think is uh, believed to, to confine uh, to confine balls in three and four dimensions. Uh, and and then again uh, with this boundary condition, we're going to study a long string. This is another type of long string that that uh, that goes uh, along uh, the entire undivided space. And now there are two regimes, right? Either ADS radius time lambda is much bigger than one, which is basically flat space limit. So we recover uh, flat space. Or uh, if we go to small radius, then the theory is weakly coupled, okay? Because we stay in the UV, and then before it uh, becomes strongly coupled, the uh, ADS curvature kicks, kicks in and, and regulates uh, the IR. Okay, so now uh, what can we learn about Wilshire theory in this case? So this is now again a concept that breaks presence of the string breaks the uh, full this is ADS isometries to ADS two. So there are still d minus two uh, sort of goldstones to the extent that you can apply this term in ADS, which has protected mass. So now they're not going to be massless. Actually, their mass is, is protected and given by twice the uh, curvature scale. Uh, and uh, now we can also think of a, a sort of a dual picture, for now a fake dual picture, because we don't have gravity in the bulk, where this corresponds to a defect in this boundary conformal gauge theory. Well, this is it's dual in parentheses, theory in parentheses, but it gauges true because with this boundary conditions, we have some gauge field uh, on the bulk. So there is this defect, and on this defect, there's going to be a displacement operator. With a protected dimension equal to okay, so this is maybe a little bit surprising because usually we think of defect displacement operator when we have a stress tensor in the boundary theories. Here we don't have stress tensor in the boundary theory, but uh, protection of the displacement operator comes from this goldstone nature of the particles uh, on the bullshit. Uh, okay, and and now well, so that's something we understand. That the question is for what are the analogs of you know soft spine or soft goldstone theorems. Uh, in this ADS case, I'm not sure. I, I think it's not known what the answer is, but the question do they constrain in some way correlation functions of the displacement operator on the boundary? Uh, okay. Now, at week, what's convenient about uh, this, uh, uh, this ADS thing is that there is a, at least conjecture, a continuum way to deform synergy by resolving any, any all the symmetries by changing the radius. To the extent when it becomes efficiently and described by perturbative gauge theory, right? And then we can try to make precise, for example, when we go to four dimensions in the bulk, we can look for this axion. And then I think in the perturbative regime, the axion will indeed correspond to the uh, insertion of the plaquette. So here I have this you know, sort of Wilson line on the boundary displacement operator, that little thing. And then this, this transverse plaquette that has the right symmetries of, of being the axion. So then we can identify this axion at, at weak coupling here, and then sort of I don't know, see what happens with it when we when we crank up the coupling. And then okay, there has been lots of progress in the understanding uh, defects in, in CFTs. Uh, and the question is what can we what can we learn? What can we learn from this development? Uh, and now, finally, I wanted to, to on, on this topic, I wanted to say, um, well, I know, question, is there some sort of Rothschild holography? So we said we don't have full holography in this setup because there is no gravity in the bulk. But on the world sheet, as also Sergey mentioned yesterday, the theory is somewhat, in some sense, gravitational uh, because there's 2D gravity. And the question is, is there some version of ADS2, you know, with some, some sort of CFT1 in this case? Uh, and at least in flat space, there is a relation to flat space uh, Jacob title bond gravity. And at least in, in D equal three through, through TT bar deformation, because I mentioned that this uh, in, in D equal three, or at least integrable Rothschild theory, uh, is the TT bar deformation. And then in this paper with Sergei Merdat, we showed that at least in flat space, TT bar deformation is equal to flat space JT gravity. So you may think, okay, does this get lifted to? ADS, and, and there is immediately a puzzle, you know, where would breaking of SO12 come from? Because we sort of learned recently that in some healthy theories of, uh, of 2D gravity in, in ADS, there is a break of the symmetry. Here it seems like, okay, where would the symmetry break come from? And maybe there is some subtle IR effect. And uh, in particular, uh, well, uh, not really, not exactly related to this puzzle, but just related to this uh, to the setup on this slide. There is paper by uh, Simona and, and Arkady Zeitlin where they studied a similar object in uh, in equals four to Pinyang Nielsen, corresponding in this five process five. So the, it, it, it sounds like okay, maybe in, in this setup we can relate uh, the two things. Okay, let me summarize. 
so we discussed uh, uh, integrable world sheet theories that are uh, numerically uh, close to the Young, mean, young Mills uh, company long string. And so I'm not saying that there is some you know, small parameter that we can take to zero continuously to obtain this non-integrable series, but just, you know, setting in the lattice data and, and inferring the spectrum and inferring the spectrum uh, of, of closed string or rotating strings from this integrable series, we seem to get a nice match. So it's, you know, it would be an interesting step for us to understand, uh, to have a better uh, definition of this integrable series. Okay, and then we have now, now we want to understand them in terms of the S matrix. Uh, and then uh, we discussed uh, long strings in uh, anti de Sitter space. Again, uh, there are some interesting puzzles, uh, interesting questions, opportunities to utilize recent developments, you know, defect bootstrap, uh, uh, other results on conformal defects. Uh, so now, uh, as, a, as a conclusion, some other future directions. Uh, again, yesterday, I think it was brought up, what about supersymmetric uh, strings? Uh, in particular, supersymmetric long strings. So we wrote we wrote one paper uh, on this, uh, and, and again, it's interesting to study this further. We just identified you know the basic low energy effective action and what are the symmetries. Uh, uh, then uh, there is a world sheet S matrix bootstrap. As I said, if if I have you know, two minutes, I can say something about it. I have backup slides. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to mention that I think an, an important future direction is uh, what is the relation to uh, high energy. Well, perturbative in parentheses QCD. That's something that there was a discussion between Sergey and Offer. And I just wanted to say what I mean by this is that okay, we have this long stream, and then on this long stream, we can now consider scattering at energies much larger than, than lambda QCD. Okay, so in some sense that should be related to perturbative QCD, but of course, because the scattering happens on top of the string, and string is an IR effect, you can never, you never become fully perturbative, but then there are, there are powerful methods like BFKL, SCAT, and then more even, even fancier uh, expansions uh, in, in QCD, and, and it would be very nice to put this input from perturbative QCD from asymptotic freedom uh, to constrain the UV of the series that we study in some way. Okay, how much, so how much time I have? Two minutes, no? Yeah, after a couple of Good. Okay. Then in two. Okay. Maybe I pause. But okay. Maybe I say two minutes and then the question. Unless there are urgent questions. Then uh, if there are no urgent questions, I'll say a few words about the Roche Desmetric Boost. Good. Uh, okay. So what's Roche Desmetric Boost? So again, I repeat my effective action. It's not Bogota the term. And then there's some non universal terms in four dimensions. That's a 4D slide or can be done in 3D. Say so that there's two coefficients. Uh, and then there's just some linear combination of these numbers alpha three and beta three that parameterize the amplitude at the first non-universal order. So now what this uh, S matrix booster people do, they input constraints from uh, crossing unitarity of the S matrix and then just numerically look at what are the allowed values of this alpha three and beta three. And they applied it to this uh, world sheet theory. And they get this uh, sort of interesting plot. So on this plot, okay, this alpha three beta three, so it's a bit small and what's allowed is above in this triangle, okay? And then there is some sort of intuition from coming from conformal bootstrap mostly that's an interesting theories that lie on the boundaries. So here they have two boundaries and on one boundary, they have uh, something that looks very much like linear Dilaton theory, okay? So the scalar pronounced massive, well, not like linear, you know, some massive version. So there is a massive Dilaton really on this side of the thing. However, on this boundary, they don't find any Dilaton, they find the axiom. Okay, already interesting. So that sort of matches uh, the what we see on the lattice. Moreover, when so there is a line, so mass of the axiom varies in some range. Okay, but there is a point on this plot, which is also non-trivial, where mass agrees with the lattice measurement. And then when they go on this point, they can also measure, you know, what the coupling is. And there is um, uh, this kind of. Uh, Triple, triple coincidence. Okay, I already mentioned that the lattice measurement of the coupling is similar to this, you know, integrable uh, value, but also booster people within whatever the error bars they have, they get the same values. Okay, you, you do whatever, whatever you want with, with, with this knowledge, but, but it exists. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, in, in principle, okay, we, we, we have, you know, what can we do? What, what more can we do in this one natural direction? 
uh, that we do with um, with Guerrero and with Sergey, uh, we're trying to understand better whether it came to the answer. Bootstrap allows us to study Rothschild series in any dimension. Lattice doesn't, right? But but this booster program can be set up in any dimension, uh, and it appears that this axonic string exists, namely the, the theory with anti-symmetric form in higher dimensions also exists. Uh, um, uh, in higher dimensions, and there is some interesting value of Q of D, meaning that there is some simple analytic function uh, that, that, that this coupling as a function of dimension gives you. And probably it means that uh, this is numerical booster, but probably it means there are some analytic dispersion relations uh, that, that we are not understanding yet. And of course, the important step here is to also input more data from QCD, something. I knew the two in the beginning. Okay, yeah, let me let me stop here. I'm on time. And... Uh, yeah. So, so why do you say that the matching between the integrability result and the bootstrap result is a coincidence? I mean, doesn't it have to be that the bootstrap bound is exactly when there's no particle production by construction? Well, it it kind of didn't. Uh, yeah, I think we've thought first. So, but actually, we don't have uh, an analytic argument here. I don't know. Maybe we're missing something because you see, uh, if, if what we said were true, because what this booster does, it, it in some sense, you know, solves, optimizes some dispersion relations, right? Because you can write down an expression for your low energy coefficients in terms of some integral or spectral density that should be positive. This is some constraint, it's non linear constraint, and linearize this constraint, and then on the boundary, you, know, you get some optimal solution. So if you were what you were saying were literally true, and then you can write down some dispersion relations for the amplitudes, and in fact, like say in 3D, you can more or less analytically see that the solution of the dispersion relation is that integrable S matrix like from CD factor. So we couldn't do it in in uh, in higher dimensions. Okay, so the, so in this sense, like it's not obvious at least why this S matrix with the pole where it is should saturate the set of dispersion relations, and and that's more or less what, what I'm alluding to. Either we are not you know, it looks like we, we at least we, you know, maybe you would write them down, but okay, we together with this group of people, uh, I don't know which group of people, whatever, this group of people roughly, we're not understanding a full set of dispersion relations that maybe can be solved analytically, which is interesting to figure out. Okay, that's at least the minimal uh, set for this problem. Maybe there is something you know, deeper going on, but we're not. Because we don't have full constraints on nonlinear Lorentz. So, but maybe it's related to the way to unitarize this kind of theory to cancel this particle production. So that's the, you're right. Yeah. They're guaranteed to have integrable theory on the boundary, but it's different theory because it's not really what is the variant, what kind of variant. Yeah. Theory. So it's not obvious what, yeah, there is a feeling like this, but we're not fully understanding, you know, why also this thing wants to cancel particle production using the axiom. But more, it's not super surprising given the previous kind of theory. So. True, true, yeah. Which is that before your papers appear, there's been some work on uh, looking at Yang Mills mainly in two plus one, but also in three plus one. If you do a longitudinal rescaling on Yang Mills, you can essentially make it anisotropic. You make one coupling smaller than the others. If you take that limit that you go all the way anisotropic, you essentially reduce the model to the principal chiral sigma model in one plus one dimension. In the color projected to zero sector, which is integrable. Now, when you remove the anisotropy, there are corrections to integrability. It no longer becomes integrable. And what happens is, is that you can implement corrections to the string tension in the different directions using the form factor bootstrap. And the particles of this model are very similar to what you guys are calling axioms. That's in four dimensions in this three plus in, one. Well, it, it's mainly done in two plus one, but there. But, is in, some but in two plus in two plus one, we are not finding any axioms. Yeah, so. but they're there. Well. And they correspond to transverse fluctuations of the model. Well, they're not there in QCD three. No, but I'm saying that's that's debatable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we, I mean, yeah, we we we'll 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 look at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Not, let me wait there. Yes, go to the coffee break.